Welcome, welcome, welcome to episode five here on the Card Heads YouTube channel. I have the honor today of sitting down with Matt Greeny from My Slabs, one of the co-founders. Thank you for your time, Matt. Uh, just want to have him on and have a nice chill chat, see what My Slabs has been up to, and uh, take it from there. So thank you for your time today, sir. Um, if you want to just kind of give yourself a, a brief introduction and and go from there. All right. For those that don't know me, I'm Matt from My Slabs, Director of Operations. Um, obviously, a low fee online marketplace for sports cards, comics, uh, soon to be branching out to other things. Uh, lifelong collector, enthusiast, turned it into a business with a couple individuals back in late 2018, early 2019. Um, just kind of thought we could do things a little bit better than the options that were out there. And uh, here we are, I guess, right? Um, if anybody hasn't checked out the site yet, myslabs.com. Um, and we'll get into some of the other things I imagine here shortly. But uh, predominantly up until this point, we were graded sports cards, uh, graded Magic the Gathering, Pokemon, um, Wax, uh, pretty much anything to do with comics. Um, you know, I think slabbed up until this point, but uh, we'll be releasing some raw, a raw division here shortly. Yeah. So um, very interested to hear kind of how your love for collecting brought you and your co-founders to really, um, you know, come out with, with a selling platform, obviously knowing that at the time eBay was um, basically the place to go. You know, we, ha we have a few options now, but knowing that coming out that's really who you're kind of bumping up against um what was your thought process and, and what really gave you guys the uh the green light to you know say we're gonna go for this we're gonna uh you know take this opportunity well that they're the prototype the gold standard you know whatever you want to label them um largest marketplace in the world we're not anti ebay we're anti sports cards ebay i mean i Everybody buys on eBay. You get, it's, it's amazing. The place is great. You can get anything there. Um, it's just the way they have the the rules and guidelines set up. You know, it, it was kind of the same all the way across the board. Whether you're selling, um, you know, coffee makers or used auto parts, um, you know, they never treated sports cards like an investment. You know, and they gave people the ability to quote unquote invest basically free of charge with their return policies and they've gotten better with it, but really it's a lot of it's kind of hollow, but essentially, you know, probably five, six, seven years ago, the returns started getting just insane on eBay. You know, people could return a card after 30 days, 60 days, you know, depending upon if they were using their credit card, 90 days, if the player or the card they bought didn't pan out and it just became so polluted with that type of uh, investor or collector. Uh, so a bunch of us got together, um, kind of thought of the pros and cons of the platform, thought about things, you know, we could do better being, you know, in the industry for basically ever. I was almost 40 years old at the time. Um, and the original platform was designed by two other individuals, um, but it's, evolved into something much bigger than I think we all thought it was going to be like we all we were all pretty sure we could grow it really well um, but we're, we're branching out in so many other different directions right now it's it's all collector based you know we're not kind of um, we're definitely sticking to our roots we're not going out on a limb with anything not trying to recreate the wheel you know some of these other websites have are just so spread out as far as ideas on how to capitalize on the collectibles market. We're sticking to what we know. Um, we have everybody in place in the company is a lifelong collector to one extent or another, specialists almost. Um, so it, it, it's really kind of a unique setup for a, a, a company in this space. Yeah, that's, that's great to hear. Um, when you guys started it, 
was it always the idea to uh, include like wax, um, the comics? I saw that you have added some digital assets as well. Um, was that always kind of the plan? Like, let's start here and 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 see what else makes sense as as we go along, or did you really want to zone in on the slabs? Um, and with the success that came with that, once you guys launched, you took advantage of these other um, areas that just naturally made sense to kind of integrate in. Well, the the original idea was slabbed cards, potentially um, like PSA merchandise that, you know, like signed helmets and so forth, um, JSA, whatever, but also to bring in slab comics because a couple of gentlemen in the company are just, they're collectors on a different level um, of comics. Uh, I'm talking just ridiculous, ridiculous levels. So the easiest thing to break into the industry though, in our opinion, was slab cards. The market was so huge and there were some things that eBay and a couple other platforms were allowing people to do that we thought were easily correctable. If you're buying a slab card, there's really no reason to return it. You know what you're buying outside of damage or you know destruction. Like you know what you're buying. It says it on the header, you know what the grade is. I mean, sometimes you run into something where a card's been sitting in a PSA slab so long, maybe you know, it's been banged up a little bit and it does not, the, the grade can't really justify the card anymore. <coughs> Excuse me, but that's few and far between. Um, you shouldn't have kind of free range to just return everything you want. Those are investments. What other market in the world do you know where you can basically put your money in and 30 to 60 days later, if your investment isn't working out, just take it all back and screw the other guy. Right. And that was costing people a lot of money. So there were some things with uh, graded cards we figured we could do better right off the bat. It was the easiest market to break into because it was exploding and eBay and the other platforms had so many issues. So we knew we could see success through the slab card market. Comics was always going to be um, a thing. It, there was just no two which ways around it, but we, we needed to grow the audience with the sports cards first. We focused on that. Um, now, I, I told you before we got on live, we're getting into areas we didn't think we ever would, that being majorly raw cards. Um, there's just so many issues associated with raw cards and condition being so subjective. We're offering them now after a kind of a long deliberation. Uh, we decided last winter we were gonna, going to pursue it. But the guidelines we're going to have in place and the policies we're going to have in place, we think we're providing a, a fairer platform than the others for both buyer and seller. Um, you can't list anything mint, gem mint in the raw card category. It's not even going to be possible. We have our own condition scale that basically we've taken the SGC, PSA, and BGS condition scales and combined. Um, and really all their wording is very similar throughout all the grades. That's just, they execute a little differently in the grading process. So we kind of mashed up all the grading, uh, grading scales, combined grades. So there's a little bit of a, you know, room buffer in case, you know, a seller's off a little bit in his assessment. And we've added uh, photo galleries, description boxes, everything every other platform has. So if there's, you know, a little flaw in the card, you can show that from any different angle. Um, so we're kind of, we think we have it worded well enough and uh, definitively enough. It might take a little bit of a learning curve because no other platform is attacking it kind of from this vantage point, but we shouldn't see a mass amount of returns. We are going to have to allow returns to an extent, uh, but that being said, buyers and sellers are also going to be on a strike program. Basically, what's going to happen is we just hired a bunch of customer service personnel that are, you know, lifelong vets in the industry. Some of these guys are groups up guys. Um, some of them have just been, you know, graders. Uh, what's going to happen in every dispute that's filed, we're going to look at it on a case by case basis. 
look at the information given, the pictures given, decide if the seller was being deceptive, if the buyer is being difficult, so on and so forth. Sometimes nobody's going to be at fault. And we're just going to have to um, kind of make our best judgment possible. But basically the strike program is if you've come to customer service too many times and you've been found to kind of be acting a way that isn't paralleling, paralleling our, our site policies, like you're abusing the, the return policy, you're going to be deactivated from buying and selling raw cards. You can still buy and sell slab cards, but you're going to have that ability turned off. So there is kind of a penalty there and there is a buffer in case somebody gets, you know, a $10,000 raw, raw card in and there is clear damage that wasn't outlined by the seller. Like maybe they weren't being that truthful or maybe their eye just isn't that good. There's going to be some leeway there. You have to with raw cards, but there's also going to be a point where um, enough is going to be enough. You know, you're not going to treat it like eBay where you're just going to return everything you want. If it turns out you are that type of person, either immediately or three strikes, you are going to be deactivated from buying and selling raw cards. And that's, you know, the other the other important thing to mention is it won't be the seller, seller fees won't be the standard 1%. They're going to be 3%. We just can't do, I imagine the customer service um, kind of stress on customer service is going to be 10 to 20 fold what it is for slab cards out of the gate. So we had to hire new people. We're going to have to hire more within a couple months. Um, so we just couldn't do that for 1%. That being said, 3% plus the standard PayPal fee of 3.49% is still a lot better than nearly all other platforms, you know, and, and you get to keep the cards in your possession. You know what I mean? It's the fastest way to transact. Um, and I think with the language we have in place, it, it's going to be fairer for everybody involved. Might take a little bit of get, getting, getting used to because it is not, you know, eBay, the way it's been done on eBay forever. Um, but I think we have it pretty well sorted out. Yeah, I, I was going to ask about the um, the strike rule. So I'm glad that you touched on that. That that makes a lot of sense. Uh, and fair, you know, fair enough. I, I think that, that that should be, you know, put in, keep people accountable. Um, I know you said that that wasn't always kind of in the plan. So what was it that, kind of got the team speaking about that and and kind of like pushed you guys over the hill to to really sit down and and put some deep thought into allowing raw cards on the platform well we've always been asked by membership if if it would be um possible and we've received a little bit of brushback from a few members saying you know they don't want to see that just to be clear you're not going to see anything you don't want to see on site. This isn't going to be mixed in with the, the slab cards. It's not going to be a free for all. We have a ton of new updates coming. Like I told you right before going on about to drop, like literally they could drop tonight. Uh, once I get done here and test the stuff, um, everything's going to be segregated into its own spots. So you'll never see a raw card. If you don't want to see a raw card, you'll never see raw lots. You'll never see raw comic books. Um, that being said, uh, basically demand. Um, we decided last winter we were going to give it a go. We just had to come up um, with the verbiage for everything, how we were going to play this, uh, how we were going to treat returns, uh, how to be fairest to everybody involved. Basically, the market dictated on site that we should at least offer it to our members. Um, and then we kind of struck gold lately with some of the other sites, you know, kind of closing doors, so to speak, for their, their raw cards and having issues with raw cards. Um, eBay's latest decision with the, the raw cards with the verification process and how they're gonna move forward with that, dropping the thresholds down to $250 uh, mid this year. Um, it just kind of made sense. We're already vetting our sellers we actively screen and remove buyers that we know are an issue in the industry. So we're already dealing with a level of honesty. Some of the other sites aren't right. And the sellers on our site do not want to be removed. Um, some of them make significant money on site. They don't, they don't want to risk anything. They're going to be as honest as possible. 
so we kind of felt like we'd have a leg up on that already. Like we aren't going to have an influx of a bunch of rock hard sellers that shouldn't be on site. Um, so we've kind of eliminated a lot of that at the door. Um, really, we just, we had to put it into motion. We, we wanted it out last month. Apparently there's a lot more moving parts than I thought there would be um, with so many different categories and different price points. So it took a little longer than expected, but as I told you right before this, it's ready today. I'm just waiting for one last test. Um, I'll be doing later tonight and I think we're going to, we're going to run it. Uh, but really it was, it was dictated by market needs and member requests. Um, and just so I, I can re, kind of retouch on that point, we're hiring and we've always hired um, people that are well vetted in the industry for customer service, for the rock hard division. Uh, actually, we have a gentleman that's written a book on counterfeit and fake cards, um, altered cards that's going to be actively screening the raw card feed to look for these cards, the problematic cards, because we don't have a no-fly list. If you want to list an 86 Fleer Jordan because you know it's authentic, you're going to be able to. Some of the other sites have no-fly lists. We're confident enough with our abilities and people involved that we'll be able to catch most of the stuff. Um, we know we're not perfect. We know we're, there's some stuff we're going to miss. Uh, customer service cases, we know we're going to get some of them wrong as far as, you know, the rock hard disputes. But we're going to do the absolute best and kind of, um, you know, just, just go from there. We know it, our, you know, <laughs> approval rate isn't going to be 100% in the disputes because we're going to be dealing with images sent, you know, basically online. There's a lot of stuff that can be hidden, a lot of stuff that can be shown, um, a lot of buy, you know, buyer and seller error just in the listings and the buying. So we know it's not going to be a flawless approach. We just think it's uh, a little more efficient than some of the others. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm curious to know kind of like, how the growth has looked from, you know, kind of behind the scenes, if you will, from when you guys started um, to really, you know, trying to get the name out there and build up the platform and, and bring on the sellers um, and the right kind of sellers to the point that you made. Um, have you seen activity just, and I assume that you have, but just continue to grow month, month over month, um, and at what point did you guys um, add in the digital aspect uh, with the actual tangible cards as well? Okay, as for growth, our membership has, we started 2021, New Year's Day, we had 12,000 accounts, which that's not a lot, but you know, we had never advertised or anything. Um, in the 13 months since, we're up to 43,000 accounts, and we grow fairly rapidly. Um, as soon as we released the quarter, we released an email blast with quarter one updates and so forth. Um, it's just been growing at a, an increasing rate. Um, sale wise, last year we had a couple really, really big months. Uh, even when our biggest month was February during the, the spike, and we only had about 15,000 members. Um, but we kind of went through a year last year that I don't know if any other market has ever seen with the massive, massive spikes, the correction, the fear, then almost a complete leveling out afterwards. It was very quick. The bottom of the market by our site um, stats was July. By September, October, there was a complete baseline, you know, and it stayed flat all through the winter for items sold. Uh, average cost per item, um, and then the the sales uh, kind of increased um, in totals. Uh, really, kind of strong throughout the winter too. So it was a very strange year. I can't say we beat you know month over month. We we just absolutely killed the prior month in sales because we didn't. We had that we had some crazy highs last January, February, then that unbelievable correction. So we've seen kind of just about everything the market can throw at us. Last year, there isn't a lot to be taken from the data 
uh, other than, you know, from September till December, really August to December, showed regrowth in the industry, um, people buying with confidence again. It kind of, the market healed much faster than I thought it would. I thought it was going to take a lot longer to get that kind of baseline going again, the flat line. It didn't. It corrected very fast. And now, um, you know, it's a, we don't see anything but promising signs on site. January was extremely, extremely strong. We matched our sales this January to last January. Um, I know we have a lot more members now, but last January was absolutely nuts in terms of sales and average cost per item. The average cost per item last January was like $700 sold on site. The average item, that that's just absolutely insane. So um, we had a great January. We're having a good February. The you know the baseball strike isn't really helping anything right now. Uh, Joe Burrow losing the Super Bowl didn't really help. Um, but we've everything seems promising to us, uh, really promising. We can see through our site statistics and kind of the um, the dynamics of our our data. People are buying rarity now you know, over, you know, say base cards and so forth and have been for a while. It was like, as soon as that, that uh, switch flipped in July, August, you could see what everybody turned to. Like everybody still wanted to buy cards and our site growth was constant through those low months. But uh, people were trying to figure out what to invest in at that point. And really it, it's been on that same baseline, average cost per item. Um, the what's being sold across baseball, football, and basketball. Base cards have made, made a little comeback over the last two weeks, but that's directly correlated to PSA opening its economy back up, I believe, and right. the ability of the cards, and everybody knows they're gonna be fluid again. Um, circling back to the NFTs, those were brought on, I wanna say May of last year. Um, we hired a new CEO, He's the one that redesigned the site and got it looking kind of more modern. Um, he had asked about, you know, potentially bringing on NFTs and so forth, digital NFTs, and those had also gone through a big spike, you know. Um, so that that was just added to the site. Uh, we knew the market wasn't going to take off, you know, right away, but it's basically just to have in the back pocket um, in case it does ever kind of explode. Uh, so we haven't seen a tremendous amount of sales through the digital NFT tab. Through my own research, I tend to think it's much bigger, uh, sports-wise anyway, in Europe, where they don't have the access to cards we do. So they're kind of forced to go the digital route. Um, but we'll see. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's one of those things. You never know what the hobby's going to do, and those could take off one minute and just kind of dominate for a little while. Yeah. Um, for sure. I, I could go on a soapbox about NFTs, but, um, how much do you think the, I have to imagine all it kind of played into your favor as far as the, the average sale price when kind of as a bunch, the, uh, the main three grading companies decided to boost up their, their pricing. Um, do you think that that played into the point you made about people looking for more of that that rarity now knowing that it costs you know much more than it did a year and a half ago to to send a card in to get graded yeah i mean that had a domino effect um retail didn't make as much sense to go out and pay ridiculous money over because you couldn't you can't sub the base and just make a killing on every box um but it definitely did, you know, the cost of grading going up so drastically. And at the time, uh, I happen to be a huge SGC fan. I always have, I've, I've always had some crazy, beautiful vintage SGC slabs, but it really hadn't dipped its toe in the modern market. So you had PSA essentially shutting its doors, BGS doing, you know, nothing. They, they just haven't helped themselves in the past two years. And SGC being kind of the only game in town, there was a lot of people reluctant to that. So it was hard to sub base cards. And if you can't sub base cards, that market becomes dried up 
because nobody wants to keep spending the money on the base cards that there's just no point to it. And then, you know, we had that scary high in January and February where like I was buying things and listing on our own website immediately at 20 to 30% higher and things were selling within three to four days. Like you could not make money in January and February, significant money. And that's not a healthy market. So everybody kind of knew it was coming. Uh, you know, the grading agencies doing what they were doing. It, it just, it was kind of a perfect storm for a correction. Um, but here we are, right? You know, PSA has opened its doors back up. They're getting flooded with all of these submissions and they're cranking them out. SGC has gained market share, significant market share. Um, to everybody that's gonna, you know, raise arms about that. I didn't say they stole it from PSA. They gained significant market share. We have eBay's data, we have our data, just they have, they've done well in the past year. Mm -hmm. um, they're not PSA. They're not going to take over PSA, but they're they've come to stay, you know, and play in the modern market. Um, there's just no two which ways about it. The, the the speed at which they turn out cards uh, and the amount of modern they were able to encapsulate while BGS and PSA were doing nothing kind of gave them a foothold. You know, people were forced to use them. The sales started to increase. Uh, I was kind of playing around on eBay's filtering searches the other day and uh, filtered, you know, three grading agencies. They sold as many BG, uh, excuse me, slabs in the last three months as BGS has. That's a significant, significant little detail. Mm -hmm. it, you know, they gained the ground. There's no, no two which ways about it. There's still people resistant to, to SGC. And I understand why you know, there's, the, the value in slabs is typically PSA, but there are, uh, they've done well. I'll leave it at that. They've done well in the last year. Yeah. In the crypto world, we call that bag bias. <laughs> People that are holding the PSA slabs. Yep. I mean, yeah, like to, to the point you made, um, you know, I, I buy all three uh, companies. I, I personally send two SGC to the point. You made the PSA was too much, BGS, I just didn't know. So SGC was kind of, you know, where I landed. Um, yeah. But stepping like outside of the sports card world for a minute and just trying to look at it objectively, during that period, they were really the only ones trying to like get out ahead of it and be proactive and yeah. keep a face out to the people. And it, it was weird to watch because in any other like industry that I kind of been involved in or looked into, if a situation like that happened, you would see exactly what happened. That, that company should gain that ground. Um, but it's, it was almost like in, in the sports card world, everyone wanted to just ignore it. Nobody wanted to talk about it. Everyone yeah. was just, you know, oh, whatever. They're they're out there saying this and saying that. So it was very interesting to uh, to watch and just see how it played out. Well, I, to be fair, I do understand. Like, people have significant money tied up in PSA slabs, BGS slabs. Um, it, it is a threat to an investment, or at least that people view it as a threat to the to the investment, right? Like. If I was sitting on $10 million worth of PSA slabs, I'm probably not going to start submitting to SGC. Like you have to protect your investment. I totally get it. Um, some of the things that were being said are just kind of nutty as far as people try to uh, defame the companies and so forth. It's it just very bizarre. And you know, these guys don't know much about SGC at all, right. or you know, one of the other grading agencies they were trying to bash. It's just people, we call them investments, but even if they're short-term flips, like the long game is investing, right? It's our way of investing. Uh, you don't want another company gaining any ground on your PSA slabs, your BGS slabs, your SPC slabs. And PSA has, you know, graded the most cards and they have the most money in their slabs. So it's going to be tough for any company to even come close to that, um, you know, that level of desirability. 
Um, it's just the, the way it is, but there's no reason that there isn't, you know, there can't be any other viable options either. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. I think, uh, I think this year will be another very interesting year as far as that whole aspect goes into it. Um, and also kind of to segue into my next question, I think will also be interesting because we're seeing all of these like acquisitions and these mergers um, being behind the desk, like from, from your point of view and the team and seeing kind of how some of these companies are trying to position themselves. Um, is that something that you guys have, have started to talk about and, and just have the conversation of, hey, you know, we may be contacted by by somebody um, because of what we have built here and kind of the money that's coming into the industry and the bigger and bigger that that it's getting. I mean, with Fanatics coming in, I personally think that once they fully take over, um, it's going to take it to a whole nother level. Uh, so I'm, I'm curious to, to hear your insight um, from where you guys are at as far as all of that? Well, it's a hot market, right? And there's a lot of people that are looking to get in this market on a major scale that have never dipped a toe in this pool before. Like the, the Mint Collective is coming up next month. There's going to be a lot of money in that room that has nothing to do with sports cards, you know, up until that night. Um, we have been contacted by several large companies um, looking to either acquire us or um, kind of partner with us, get some equity. Right now, it just doesn't make sense with what we have coming down the pipeline and what we're gonna bring to the industry. Um, we It just doesn't make sense for us. Um, we've had a couple uh, fairly famous personalities attempt to, you know, to buy us or get in with us. And we're, we have our eye on the prize right now as far as um, executing the updates that we promised everybody we would. The raw card division, which again, that could be ready tonight, depending upon the testing. The high end sales, um, our showcase, so to speak, um, where we're going to have essentially ship my cards, be an escrow service for us for the sports cards. There's no no possibility of a buyer or seller getting screwed in the process we have coming up, and we'll be able to facilitate payments up to I believe a million and a half dollars out of the gate. Um, it's going to be the safest, most secure way to buy and sell high-end sports cards. And we have the ability to give basically 0% fees, seller fees on some of this stuff, depending upon the payment method used. So not only will it be the safest way to buy and sell high-end sports cards, but it'll also be the cheapest. And due to the kind of procedure we're going to be having for that, um, the money turnaround, you know, if you, if typically those type of cards are going to be sold through auction houses, you're going to wait for your money three to five weeks. Um, you know, and that's, you know, maybe sometimes longer. And if you're the buyer, you're going to be waiting for that product for probably three to five weeks. Um, with what we have in place, the realistically, the buyer can have the card in his hands within a week and the seller can be paid out 24 to 48 hours. Um, and again, there's no possibility of anybody losing their money or their product in the system we're gonna have in place. So at this point in time with everything we have coming down the pipeline, it just doesn't make sense for us to kind of give up the company. And we love what we do for the most part. Yeah, um, so you, just, you said a lot right there. Um, as so I, I personally am, am very much into um nfts uh the crypto space um outside of also being involved in sports cards but i say that because a lot of the times when you are looking at these projects you really do like a deep dive on the team and what their motives are and what their goals are and what the long-term plan is. And to hear you say that you guys are already being contacted by companies, personalities, um, 
And to know that you turned them down for me says a few things. And I want to highlight that because for somebody else looking for a platform um, or a place to kind of attach themselves to, I think the fact that you guys said no says a whole lot about your confidence in uh, the plan that you guys have. Your, your, like you said, it's something that you guys love. Uh, it could, it's very easy to build something. Uh, it's not easy to build something. It's easy to build something and then get to that point where someone's like, let's cash you out. And you're like, okay, done. But to say no means that you truly believe inside that what you're building is going to be much bigger than what they're offering. And so I want people to understand that. Uh, I appreciate it. Yeah, no, that's, that's, uh, that makes me very bullish actually on, on what you guys have coming down, down the line. Um, and to touch on, on the escrow partnership with Ship My Cards, that's also, I, I did not know that. That's also very interesting um, because to your Good. point, everything should already be there. And so once, once it's okay, then it can just be released to both parties and there isn't that, that waiting period in between. Right, we, you, you probably understand how Ship My Cards work. If anybody watching, isn't uh go check it out it's they have a great great platform they do huge business mainly with international um selling but they also have an oregon facility so the the tax the sales tax thing comes into play if you want to save on sales tax um that what we have going on with them is just going to be short flawless kind of execution card goes into an account we're notified essentially release funds, done deal. It's put in the buyer's account and they're free to do whatever they want, whether they want it shipped, held there, uh, you know, whatever. But it, it's really a simple, simple process. Depending upon how fast that seller gets the card out, like if, say somebody sells a $175,000 card on Tuesday night, they overnight that to ship my cards. Ship my cards is going to let us know Wednesday that that card is now in the my slabs account ready to be transferred to the buyer and we can pay that seller out 24 hours you know it's that's unheard of for transactions that big that's typically auction house style payments um and again we're going to be able to we're bringing on another payment processor um we're bringing on stripe because paypal has that sixty thousand dollar threshold for most people so we're going to be able to take just about any form of payment from all over the world. Um, wow. And depending upon what's used, wire, ACH, credit card, you know, the fees are kind of dictated upon that. But I believe we're not going to be charging the sellers any fees. Um, so that, I mean, you can't beat it. it it's just the, the process is going to be quick and painless. H N S. It's, I think it's going to be an extremely interesting option to people who otherwise were only allowed, you know, able to use auction houses previously or eBay. And that can be a little scary if you're something that selling something that big on eBay. Yeah. Yeah. I think having like a third party escrow is uh, definitely a safety, safety uh, net to have there for sure. Having trouble managing your valuable collection and finding price transparency in the sports card market? Me too. That's why I use CardHedge. CardHedge is a brilliant price analysis and collection management tool. Track all your grades across PSA, CSG, HGA, SGC, BGS, and as well as your raw cards. CardHedge pulls their research from sites like eBay, Starstock, MySlabs, and Golden Auctions. You want an accurate picture of the sports card market? Yeah, me too. With over tens of thousands of cards in their system, Card Hedge is the definitive sports card price guide. Quickly search by card, player, or set. Sort by price or percentage change. It has a lot of awesome advanced features. So what are you waiting for? Join today for only $14.99. And if you know Brian, Brian Wells, the owner, and those guys there, they're just awesome people. They love cards. That's another homegrown business. He grew that from 
you know, basically nothing up until what it is now. He absolutely loves what he does. He's employed, I believe, his entire family now, you know, amongst other people. They've just grown and they run a great, great business. So it should be a good partnership. Uh, how, we'll see time, how it goes. Um, like what's the time frame that you guys are looking for that? I don't want to set it in stone because every time I do, um, I, you know, when tech guys tell me that I'm an idiot, uh, but that's supposed to be ready for March 1st. Um, everything's kind of crammed into the first quarter here or the, you know, everything we've been dreaming about this winter's crammed in the first quarter, but it's supposed to be March 1st. We have to actually set up um, some sales tax stuff because the markets are changing, market laws and stuff are changing, and we kind of have to come into compliance with them when they take, up, take effect. So we have to do a bunch of other stuff in regards to that, just so um, everybody will be covered, um, you know, buyers, sellers, whatever. And we're also going to kind of encourage everybody through links on the website and information on the website to apply for, you know, your resale certificate. If anybody isn't really sure what that is, uh, basically you avoid paying sales tax uh, on your purchases or use a facility like Brian Wells at, you know, Ship My Cards, Oregon facility where it's tax free. Uh, so while we are being forced to slowly implement sales tax and it won't be, you know, all 40, Five states, I believe, at once that have it. It's going to be kind of slowly incorporated throughout the year. Uh, we are going to show people the ways to kind of circumnavigate that uh, if if they choose. You know, um, there's there's a distinction between a hobby and a business. Um, uh, you know, for tax purposes, you never want to fall on the side of the hobby. If you're the hobbyist, you you take a screwing big time. So it's it's better for people to get their resale certificate, in particular with all the new laws coming out, get your resale certificate um, and kind of business as usual. Yeah. Uh, so with you touching on those points, I get the sense that uh, the team's really thinking about kind of new, uh, innovative, like untouched spots where you guys can kind of position yourselves um as far as like adding the digital assets adding this escrow third-party service uh which is really cool um adding the raw cards as well do you is is there more um obviously without getting into any like details that you can't share are there other areas kind of in and around the collectible space that you guys are looking at? Yeah, I mean, I don't want to give away too much of it. Um, the digital NFT thing, um, I don't want to underplay that because that's been on site, but it's only been for sports. And I believe the real money is in like the punks and, you know, the board apes. And um, I could give you a horror story of my man Dio that actually works for us trying to get me to buy a punk go halves last, I want to say last February, for like 16 grand. And I said, no, because I don't understand the stuff. I'm terrible with technology. And right. he's like, you should, man. Let's split it. Split it. 16 grand. I think like, I think it was, it's worth like 350 right now. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah, got exactly. gifted because he was one of the original punk buyers. He got gifted one of those. I don't even know what it is, but he got gifted another NFT and he got a rare skeleton out of it. And I'm like, <laughs> but to, to, to kind of circle back there. Um, sport, digital, and NFT, I've always kind of been weary of just because there is that physical product. Um, I think it's bigger in Europe just due to the lack of being able to buy cards. But Ken, our CEO, has always kind of wanted to set something up as far as being able to transact NFTs, like having the wallets and having everything linked that but i know that takes a great deal more programming than anything we have on site and the security that needs to be in place and so forth um <clears throat> excuse me whether or not that comes to uh reality i don't know um but that 
that's definitely been kind of discussed. Um, we do have some other things as far as wax we'd like to do. We're not going to be doing the live breaks and all that other stuff. So, you know, there's plenty of other platforms for that. And just seems kind of, we have um, Discord coming out with some pretty neat features you can't find on other Discords. They're unique to our website. I don't want to give those away because they're very obvious and somebody else could just do it. That That's ready to roll. Um, Part of the updates that are about to drop is we have a massive amount of filters going in. Like the site right now has a lot of filters, but it's been upgraded, you know, tenfold. And we have safe searches that are done. So you'll be able to get the email notifications daily for cards you want to save search. Um, but we are always looking to improve. Um, we're never going to be complacent. Uh, and the beauty of what we have going, we, we didn't have a big budget in the beginning and I figured I'd make a Facebook welcome form to kind of get it off the ground, bring all my friends in from the card community on Facebook. There's probably like 9,000 people in there, which isn't a ton, but you get a great feel of what people want in the industry or want from the platform from these people, because there's just posts all day long. Um, do you think this is possible? Could we do this? Is this, you know, so we always have this kind of, uh, influx of ideas and flow of ideas and people contacting me and saying, Hey, do you think there's a lot of bad ideas, a lot of really good ideas? And we will always try to facilitate and accommodate, uh, for our members. Um, they're, they're our pride and joy, so to speak. They're, they're what got us here and why not give them what they want? So if all of a sudden the industry is calling for something, you can assume that we'll be looking into it and trying to set it in motion. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> that's exciting to hear as well touching back to like the nft community hearing you say that that's uh so i uh, i know like this is a uh sports card channel right uh but there is a lot of crossover between the sports cards and the nfts and a so overlap. yeah a lot and so when when these points come up i want to make sure uh, we're able to share and what you were just saying on how you guys have this forum and you're able to bring in the ideas and and you implement the ideas that you hear the community giving you uh, that's one of the big areas in which why you see a lot of people now going into the the web3 and the nft space is because it's getting a lot less centralized where you have a group of people making all the decisions and everyone else has to live with it and now it's becoming decentralized where when you join a project, your voice is heard to the point that you just made. And the community is able to help actually guide the ship instead of just being a passenger on the ship. And so hearing you say that you really take all of those uh, community inputs into account and try to implement what it is the community is looking for. Um, I, I think that's really good. I think that's something a lot of people are not doing um, in the traditional business space. And so, I, yeah, I, I just big ups to you for, for actually doing that. To be honest, it's about the most unorthodox approach to business I think I've ever experienced. But it's not that it's not effective. It's, this industry is extremely, extremely unique. And a lot of big money has bought in in the last two years and tried to push push their way in and kind of um, basically just push their ideas on people and expect them just to work. You know what I mean? Because they had money, and that's not that's not the way the industry is going to go. Um, we we constantly look for information from our members, and everybody's free to go and join the the My Slabs Welcome Forum on Facebook. By the way, just if you're not a, if you're not even sure about the website just go in take a look see if it's for you there's a giant community there but i get asked quite a bit about features and functions and opinions um they say well don't you want this or wouldn't you like this i'll tell uh, i tell them the same thing every time it's not relevant what i want or what we want at my slabs or the partners or anybody else it does not matter like if we start dictating what goes on site according to our own wants or desires, the website's going to fail. 
you have to crowdsource uh, your audience in this book, in this space. I honestly believe that. There's been a lot of websites that have popped up in the last year and a half to two years. I'm sure you've seen it in the crypto world too. Um, that just assume they're going to dictate what goes on and what's going to be popular and what's going to be right for everybody. That's not the way it works. This isn't business in 1950 anymore either. You know, I, I have to interact with a lot of people on social media and so forth. Um, try to tell people, you know, business now in particular with, you know, collectibles and NFTs is not run like it was in 1950 where everything's prim and proper. I mean, you have, Gary V and all these other guys coming out, you know, CEOs of companies that are swearing at, you know, their members and so forth. It's just not the same thing. And if you're going to try to use social media as a weapon to harm these companies, you would kind of have to expect that sort of thing. Um, not that I go on and, you know, attack anybody, but sometimes, um, you know, I, I engage in conversations and people need to be told, you know, the truth. And, you know, some people don't necessarily appreciate that. I try to tell them they're using social media as a weapon. You know, it, it has to be answered. So it's, it's very interesting in the space we're in, you know, the, the industry has evolved across the board in all the collectible areas. It's, uh, I don't know, it's unique to anything else in the world. That's why I don't really understand some of these guys, um, you know, treating this industry like the other industries they just come from. It, it doesn't make sense. The same rules don't apply. Yeah. Yeah. I think that goes back to uh, what I was saying with, with just that whole time frame when like PSA and BGS were completely silent and SGC was really the only, only ones out. And it was just so odd. It, it was very odd to see how it all played out because to your point, like, in another industry, I just don't see how it would have played out the same way. But anyway, um, well, you, even if you look at their ads, when they, you know, they saw an opening, and they'll even admit they got a little full of themselves, and their their ads were targeted directly at other companies and the Times and so forth. Well, they got inundated with cards and overwhelmed, and they weren't ready for it, so they were then guilty of, you know, the the kind of ads they were targeting uh, at people. So it's, uh, it is, it, it's not, it's not like any other industry. I love it. Uh, we'll, we'll see. There's going to be more money in this industry over the course of the next 10 years. I mean, you've seen what you know, fanatics is planned. Yeah. So that was actually perfect segue because that was my next question was I wanted to get from um, a team like, like you guys who, who, are really get a hands-on view of like the selling and the buying. What is your hot take as far as once Fanatics takes this over here? Um, and how do you think that's going to affect just the industry in a whole? And what are some new areas that you think that may open up? Well, I am extremely happy. I'm, I'm huge in continuity. Like I grew up with certain brands. Uh, I wanted to see those brands continue, mainly tops. I mean, Panini is a little bit different. Most of their brands like Prism, which I absolutely love, that didn't come out till 2012. So it's not like something I grew up with. They were things I could have lived without. I'll be sad if Flawless isn't remade or something like Flawless because I love Flawless. But really, I was concerned about the lack of Topps flagship and, you know, kind of not disrupting the industry, but just basically canceling everything that had happened previously um, as far as products. Because if they didn't buy Topps, obviously they couldn't produce Topps. Um, that, that's like shutting the door. I don't want to say on a generation because that isn't correct, but almost, um, well, I mean, all the products you've, you've loved previously, right? Um, I was actually extremely excited to hear Mr. Luber um, kind of comment about that on another podcast that we had done, um, saying that absolutely the continuity was important. The history was important. Those cards you had in your closet were important. Um, 
and that there was brands he loved and the other guys in the company loved. And, you know, that was extremely refreshing to hear. Like, I'm glad they, they recognized that. And, you know, eventually they ended up buying tops anyway, but they have the ability to kind of right a lot of the wrongs in the industry from the wax side. Um, I think they're going to attempt to, uh, I'm hoping they bring products cheaper to the masses. I think that's the game plan. Um, because a lot of this stuff is out of control as far as pricing goes, you know, retail absolutely through the roof in the secondary market for the most part, even now. I mean, there, there are brands that don't do too well in the secondary market. That's just basically because the base card market kind of died, um, or corrected itself. I'm excited to see the game plan when Josh Luber said that, uh, you know, they didn't want to sit on the sidelines for the next few years waiting to produce cards. And then they went out and, you know, bought tops. I think they've kind of identified a lot of the issues in the industry and are going to try and write them, whether that be far less redemptions or, you know, making certain products that all of the autos are going to be inside. I don't know how much of a reality that is with the whole COVID thing going. Um, in particular, if it, you know, continues down the road, <coughs> excuse me. Um, I'm excited to see. I, w I was a little more skeptical when they hadn't bought Tops or Panini. I still think they might end up buying Panini, um, in which case, aside from their own ideas, they're going to, I would assume they would continue all the most popular brands for everybody that are used to them. Uh, but I think... They have all the money in the world to do whatever they want, right? Um, I don't think they're going into this blind, and I don't think they're going into it, uh, you know, essentially with what we just talked about with, well, I'd like to see this, I want this. I'm sure they've done all the research in the world. Um, you know, a lot of those guys are collectors. They know what's going on. I think they will at least attempt to right the ship on a lot of the issues that we've had for the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. So here's my hot take. And I know a lot of people in this industry will not like it and or completely disagree. And that, that's completely fine. I think that we're going to see a lot of digital NFT uh, cards once Fanatics takes over. Um, and let me share why. One, they are spending massive amounts of money to position themselves where they are, okay? And I know a lot of people still don't understand exactly how NFTs work and the benefit in which it would bring to a company like Tops and Panini uh, and Fanatics. So currently, I'll just use um, the, uh, the 2009 National Treasures set that recently was purchased for $3.3 million. Okay. Lewis. Yeah. Yeah. It's a beautiful set. Right. And and the cards are beautiful. And the artist that did something that created it did a great job. And Panini, you know, put that product out. But when that set just got sold, the artist and Panini did not get one cent from that sale. And if that sale was done in NFTs, however, the artist and the company would get secondary sales. And to your point of them not going into this blind <clears throat> and knowing the circles that the owners of Fanatics stay in, um, I, they are well aware of this. And I think that any uh, smart business person coming into an industry looking to make money uh, would definitely take that into account, right? If, if I'm going to produce this card that I know is, you know, like to your point, the flawless, if I'm going to produce these high-end cards that I know are going to uh, garner good resale value over the years, down the line in perpetuity, uh, why would they not do it in a way where they actually get to benefit as the manufacturer off of those sales, um, especially when we have the technology to do so. 
Um, yeah. so, so that's one reason why I think so. Another reason why is to your point on the redemptions completely takes out all of this, this wait time completely takes out um, miscut or damaged redemptions or sticker autograph redemptions. Uh, you're able to instantly get that redemption um, and you don't have to worry about any of those other aspects to it. Uh, so that's two. And the third one is really just uh, <laughs> the, the hands-on um, manufacturing set after set after set after set when a lot of it could be um, digital. Um, and I know there's a lot of, you know, purists who need it in their hand. Um, and I'm not I, completely with it, right? I have thousands of cards. But again, it is a business. And thinking about it from the business standpoint and knowing just fanatics and, and the team that they have over there, I, I really uh, think that we're going to see a lot of that when when they take over and a big um, integration of the digital with with the physical, um, especially too like with the print run issues that everybody is is talking about now um, and nobody really knows. People are like okay, well we're estimating there's this many you know printed. Um, blockchain technology completely takes that out. There's, there's no way to hide it. It is what it is. And it's forever there for nobody to change. Um, so that's my hot take. I, I think that we'll see a lot of that get integrated. Well, they didn't buy the company or, you know, companies to basically keep status quo, right? They don't want to keep everything on the same level. Uh, I believe they were on record as saying they want to grow the sports card industry alone by fourfold over the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. And I have no doubt, you know, <coughs> excuse me, they're going to go global on a much bigger scale than I'd say Tops and Panini ever tried to, you know, whether that means putting distribution facilities over these, um, you know, that uh, they're absolutely going to do it. And if NFTs and uh, digital cards um, are going to sell and there's going to be a market for them, or even if they can expand the market, you know, to the point it makes sense for them, they're absolutely going to do it. I'm not leaving. I'm not leaving. The show goes on. Um, I mean, let's be, pull, let's be serious. Like when, when you hear people talk about the future of the hobby, the future of the hobby is the youth coming up and keeping it going and taking it from us, right? Like my son and, and his friends, and at some point we're going to get old and we're going to need the new generation to come in. And that generation is digital. There's just, there's no way around that. They are almost pure digital. Uh, they understand it. It makes so much sense to them as uh, a generation. And so if, if the goal is to keep it growing and to expand it, then at least from my point of view, right, you're not marketing to this next wave that's going to come in. And, and that next wave is quickly moving fully into the digital world. I, I would say to that point, there is one thing that physical sports cards and that whole industry can always have. Um, and that's the liquidity, right? Uh, the thing that nobody wants to talk about out in public is taking cards to the shows, turning it into cash, and just kind of washing your hands of everything. Um, you know, th that is extremely attractive to a lot of people. Um, that's never going to go away. It's just not. Um, but I do think there's room for growth in so many different areas, in particular, if they're going worldwide with everything, and I say if they are going worldwide, right. with everything. Um, I pulled a Dan Marino flawless NFT, uh, excuse me, blockchain patch auto out of my last box of flawless football. Um, sold pretty well. It was like 250 bucks, and Marino's cards don't sell that well. So it 
you know, there's room for all of that stuff. There definitely is. People get extremely heated in Facebook forums and discussions and so forth about NFTs not being, I don't understand NFTs. I'm like, I don't understand. I mean, I kind of understand how they work now because uh, Dio always kind of <laughs> teaches me, but um, I've always been a physical asset guy. That's just me. It doesn't mean I don't understand the allure for other people. Just because I personally would rather have a physical card doesn't mean like I don't get it. Like it, it is what it is. It is a digital age and that stuff is going to continue to grow. Um, I do think there's a better ceiling for um, the non sport NFTs, like the, you know, the board apes and punks and all that other stuff. I think that ceiling's higher. But I also think there's room to grow sports, digital, and NFTs. Yeah, yeah, that's well said. Yeah, uh, none of the points that I was making, um, I think that the physical will always be there, 100%, especially with, obviously, with the vintage. Like, that, you can't remake the vintage into NFT. I mean, you could, but it would completely kill off the whole, you know, allure of having the vintage card. Um, so I definitely agree. The, the sports card shows 100%. Like that stuff's not going anywhere at all. Um, and I don't think it should, right? Like sports cards got to where they are because of what they were. And to the point that, that you were making earlier, I don't think it's about like reinventing the wheel. I think it's just thinking about ways in which to grow the industry and, and bring it into new sectors, right? And new eyeballs and new money. I mean, yep. you know, you wanna attract these, these new investors in. Um, so, so you, you know, market to them and, and, you know, make it a good avenue that they could also uh, go into. Um, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, absolutely. Some of these, uh... Newer, younger guys that, you know, have a lot of money may not understand why anybody would want to own a three inch by five inch piece of cardboard, um, but they might understand why somebody would want to own a one of a kind digital asset. Um, a lot of people seem to get defensive over the inclusion of anything like digital NFT. It doesn't mean the cardboard is going to be pushed out or made less relevant. It's just the industry growing. That's just mm -hmm. the way it is. And it's not necessarily a bad thing because some of those NFT guys might decide they really love cardboard. They want to own cardboard. They want to put that thing in their safe. Uh, you know, it's anything that helps the market is, is I'm fine by. I, I don't understand the guys that kind of go up in arms about the digital stuff. It just is what it is. It's, a, it's evolution. Right. Yeah, I, I agree with you um, on that. and. It will be interesting to see moving forward with with the changes that are coming up. Um, random question: If if Fanatics does buy Panini, do you think? And obviously, this is complete hypothetical, but it's fun to just mess around and think about. Do you think yeah. then there would be a, a shot at seeing Tops football and basketball again if they were to own both of the rights? I think that has crossed their mind on so many different ways because Tops Chrome basketball, are you kidding me? Like Exactly. God! Wow! Oh, everybody's been dying for that since, oh, absolutely. And, you know, I would love for them to be able to buy Upper Deck because Michael Jordan licensed autos again. Are you kidding me? Yeah. Like, oh, man. Like, so... I think they end up with Panini. I, you know, Panini has a lot of other stuff that they can sell, like the UFC and uh, F1 and soccer. Um, but I would have to imagine basketball and football is their bread and butter. And even if it isn't, it's a significant chunk. Um, they'll be losing. I think Fanatics ends up with them, and I, you know, I would love to see them bring back, you know, the old top Strome football, basketball, because uh, then you'd have like some cool retro products that the kids nowadays aren't necessarily really either aren't aware of or don't necessarily respect because they just never collected that stuff, you know? So the retro products, 
like just look how good the uh the prism retro did this past year with like zion and you know um you know the 2012 retros some of the resales on that stuff was nuts and that's just 2012. Right. bring back tops chrome 96 97 tops chrome basketball yeah that uh that would be pretty impressive yeah yeah i'm i'm, I'm hoping that something like that can uh as well as i'm sure a lot of other people are uh bring back that nostalgic feel uh yeah the, well, that would be imagine if, if they were able to produce a Michael Jordan, LeBron James, dual flawless patch auto like yeah. that. You want to take high end to another level, put those guys on flawless with uniforms and like sick. That would be absolutely insane. Have somebody mocked one up online. Uh, might've been IG, a Jordan um, patch auto for flawless. And the thing looked so phenomenal. It was just such a beautiful card. Um, uh, probably because nobody had ever seen anything like it before, but it, that would be amazing. Absolutely love that if that could happen. Yeah, yeah, it really would. Um, well, look, uh, you've given me about an hour of your time here, so I don't, I don't wanna keep you anymore. Um, but I, I do wanna end with just saying uh, thank you for your time. And a lot of the stuff that, that I heard, I, I didn't previously know. Uh, and it was cool to hear some some different innovation like like that third party escrow um and some of the other things that you have coming here down the pipeline and i'm sure you held back some things that uh are going to be exciting for the industry so um you know i i really loved to hear to be honest with you that you guys have been approached multiple times um by just businesses and and different celebrity personalities uh, and said no. Um, I think most people would not have said no. So that for me personally, um, I appreciate uh, they, that. They A couple of them seemed a little shocked as well. Um, I think they understood, but I, uh, I think that some of these guys are just kind of used to getting yeah. what they want. If you told me, five years ago because i'm working class i'm very much blue collar i've been in the construction industry my entire life um you know if you had told me five years ago that we would have been in a position to say no to the figures thrown around i would have just laughed at you but it's we take pride in what we do we think we execute better than anybody else uh, and we're going to continue to grow and bring things to the masses um, we're hoping people give us a try um, you know, if you're uh, one of the guys that is used to returning everything on eBay, the site is not going to be for you. Uh, it's just not going to happen. So, but no, I, I appreciate your time. This was fun, and uh, you know, be uh, should be an interesting next few months. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and just for the audience, I'm going to uh, put down in the description links to uh, the website. Um, Twitter, Instagram, all that stuff. So that if you're not familiar with my slabs and you haven't checked it out before, uh, you can just go down there, click it, go check out the site. Um, and you know, see, like, like Matt said, see, see if it's for you and, and see how it is compared to some other platforms that you might be, uh, you know, messing around with. Just if I could, I kind of forgot to, I got lost in conversation here. For anybody that's not familiar with the site, you can typically buy and buy products cheaper than anywhere else. Uh, we move a ton of wax. We have all the latest hot wax because our seller fees are so low. Um, so if you like keeping more money in your pocket as a buyer or seller, you should think about giving us a shot. Uh, we move a ton of product, wax, labs, comics, um soon to be raw cards here maybe tonight um see how that goes um but i do i appreciate your time i appreciate you doing that for us and it was great to be on absolutely yes um and thank you everybody for hanging out with us here and checking this out and um again the descriptions will be in um the links will be in the description for anybody to go check out my slabs 
and look forward to seeing everybody around on the next one. Thanks, Matt. Thanks a lot.